welcome everybody for our fourth community forum on H2A housing. Uh, recognize some of you, some of you have been to this before, some of you are new. For those of you who are new, our format is, uh, what we like to do is have, we're going to have a short presentation on the program, the H2A program, an overview of it for those that are unfamiliar with it. Uh, after that, uh, we will hear from our panelists, and uh, I'll take this opportunity to introduce them real briefly. I uh, appreciate them co they're coming uh, tonight. On the, the far end is Laura Brown from the Stra uh, Strawberry, uh, California Strawberry Commission. Uh, next to her is Claire Wyman from the Grower Shipper Association. Uh, next to her is Carlos Castaneda, and I, what's, I forgot the name of your uh, company. Oh, just he's a labor contractor. Okay. His company will remain anonymous. <laughs> and and a local farmer, George Adam. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves when they start uh, their presentation. Uh, the way we're, we're doing this is we're letting them talk, give their presentation, and then if there's questions, we're asking people to write them down. It seems to go better that way. Uh, although all three of the previous forums, we ran out of written questions and we turned the mic, we turned it into an open mic and, and walked the mic around the room and, and let people answer questions or ask questions. And we'll do that again tonight. But if you have any questions right now that you want for sure to be answered, uh, please fill out a card. There's pens and cards, and then there's a little basket to put the cards in. Uh, there's some extra agendas. And lastly, there's anyone that needs translation. Of course, if you do, you may not understand what I'm saying. But if there's anyone that would request translation, we do have a translator here with a some excellent equipment, and uh, just go to the back of the room and uh, see the translator if uh, you want to. He's back there. If you want uh, some assistance in understanding what's going on. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Glad you didn't leave yet, James. James is our uh, IT person that is helping uh, set the, help set this up. All right, for those of you who know and for those of you who don't, the H2A program is a federal program. It allows agricultural employers who anticipate a shortage of domestic workers to bring non-immigrant foreign workers, usually from Mexico here, uh, but some Central American countries as well, uh, to perform agricultural labor, labor or services of a temporary or seasonal nature. Uh, the definitions are, are specific. Uh, temporary is less than, uh, no longer than a year. And it's seasonal, it's, it's above what is necessary for ongoing operations. Uh, the use of the program is rising nationally. The number of H2A programs has increased pretty dramatically, I think you'll agree. And it's, this is from, that's 2016, it's the last year on that chart. I, I believe it's probably gone up since then. In California, it's the same. It's gone up considerably. In California, there's a 28% increase from uh, pre the previous uh, from the previous year, uh, three times nearly the national growth rate. So this is a very important issue. And here in California, excuse me, here in uh, Santa Barbara County and in uh, Monterey County, they're the two most affected counties in the uh, state. So the basics. Employers must first, before they can hire any H-2A workers or apply to hire any, they must first recruit any available U.S. workers. Okay, that's the first thing. We'll hear some more about that later. One of the requirements is they must provide housing at no charge to the worker, and transportation to and from the work site must be provided to the worker unless it just so happens that the worker lives within a, a certain distance of the work site. Uh, and they have to pay what's called the adverse effect wage rate, which is higher than the California minimum wage, uh, which is $13.18 in 2018. I'm sorry, that's the adverse effect wage rate. The California minimum wage is 11. Uh, the adverse effect wage rate is the minimum wage rate that the department has determined must be offered and paid to H2A workers and workers in corresponding employment for a particular occupation. Uh, so that similarly employed U.S. workers will not be affected. Also, any U.S. workers that um, take advantage of this program have to be paid the same rate, wait, uh, rate, wage as well. They're reviewed annually and updated by the U.S. Department of Labor. 
Uh, the regulations for the U.S. Department of Labor also provide that they must pay at least the highest of the adverse effect wage rate or the prevailing hourly wage rate, prevailing peace rate, an agreed upon collective bargaining rate, if any, and or the federal state minimum wage, in effect, whatever's highest. So, I'll get a little closer. Um, first step in bringing an H2A and HTB, we're not talking about that, but it's a similar program. But the first step is that the U.S. employer applies for labor certification from the uh, Department of Labor. And if the certification is granted, the U.S. employer submits a petition to the Department of Homeland Security. If that petition is approved, and that involves a background check of the workers. Uh, the, if the petition is approved, the foreign worker applies for a visa from the State Department. And then the foreign worker has to seek admission to the U.S. Port of Entry. So you can see there's multiple agencies and multiple steps in the process. And I'm actually impressed with how quickly it moves, uh, considering how many different agencies are involved. Okay, a little more detail. The, uh, the actual job offer is a form called ETA Form 790, and it's submitted to the in California or any it's submitted to the state workforce agency in California. That's the EDD the uh, Employment Development Department. Um, and heck, this is the fun part. It can't, be, it can't be applied for more than 75 calendar days and no fewer than 60 calendar days before the start date of the job. As you can imagine, that's a very narrow window. So if you know that you're going to need workers in August, you can't apply in January. You have to wait until 75 days before, uh, before you can do that. Step two. The employer must file an application for temporary employment certification. This form is called the Form 9142A. Uh, also filed with the Department of Labor. Uh, this one has to be filed no later than 45 days. It states that there are no sufficient able, willing, and qualified U.S. workers available to perform the temporary and seasonal agricultural employment, and that the employment of the workers will not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of similarly employed U.S. workers. As I said, that's the condition of being able to even apply for the workers. Uh, Department of Labor reviews the application and normally will notify the employer of a decision to accept or reject in seven days. Like I said, that's pretty fast. The initial application is accepted or amended, then there's some time extensions. Um, notification will state that a certification, certificate determination will be made 30 days before the date in which the workers are needed. Okay, if the application is accepted, the EDD will direct to circulate a copy of the work order or the job order, and at that point the employer is required to engage in positive recruitment of U.S. workers and submit a report of its efforts. The positive uh, employment efforts include placing an advertisement on two separate days, one of which must be in a Sunday newspaper uh, in the area of attended employment and appropriate to the occupation and workers likely to apply for the job at opportunity. Now the advertising must contain the following information. Obviously, the employer's name, geographic area of employment, description of the job, anticipated start date, dates, end dates of employment, the wage offers, uh, the free force guarantee. And this is something that's unique to the H2A program. If a contract is entered into between a labor supply contractor or a farmer uh, with the workers, they basically are on the hook for three quarters of the total contract value. If there's not enough work, if the crops are washed out by uh, monsoonal rains, they still got to pay three quarters of the total uh, wages that uh, could be paid under the contract. Uh, also, that, that has to be stated in the app. Uh, if applicable statement of work, that work tools, supplies, and equipment will also be provided at no cost to the worker. Also, a statement that housing will be made at no available, uh, made available at no cost. Transportation uh, will be provided to the by the employer. Statement position is temporary. Total number of job openings the employer tends to fill. And then, so that's it's pretty detailed the information that's required, and this must be continued. The recruitment must be continu uh, uh, continued until 50% of the period of the work contract has elapsed. And if any U.S. workers are referred by the EDD or 
workers come forward and say, I want the job, they have to be, they have to be hired. And I, I actually had a question, I think I already forgot the answer, one of the previous, uh, what if the, all the positions are full, do they still need to hire a U.S. worker? Yeah, so that's something I, I, I was kind of surprised about as well. Okay, now if the certification is granted, uh, the employer's granted the, uh, the number, or if it's granted the number of job opportunities, uh, and they've done the positive recruitment, uh, but they have to continue to possibly improve until the workers have departed for the place of work or three days before the job uh, starts, whatever is earliest. And that's what, that was my question, uh, the question I just asked. They must continue to refer the eligible, qualified workers seeking employment. So the recruitment efforts have to go on for quite a while. Okay, this is the next step, the next agency. Once the certificate is granted from the Department of Labor, the employer must file a Form I-129 Department of Homeland Security, and, and then the United States Citizen and Immigration Services conducts a background check on the workers. Uh, if, the, if they pass the background, they are required to apply for an H-2A visa. That's where actually the title of the H-2A comes from. It's, that's what it is. It's an H-2A visa. Uh, and they file it with the State Department and U.S. Embassy or Consulate and then seek admission. And it's, they can also seek admission directly at a U.S. port uh, of entry if the worker does not require a visa. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the uh, federal H-2A program. We haven't really gotten into some of the details. That's more or less the regulations concerning the actual job recruitment and the position. The housing component is what we want to focus on, and, and state law also has something to say about that. There's something called the California Employee Housing Act. Uh, it was written at a time when there wasn't any H-2A to speak of, certainly not in California, and it was intended to basically be farm worker family housing, but the law still applies to the situation, and it requires um, that the Department, the California Department of Housing and Community Development conduct inspections and issue permits for proposed employment employee housing uh, unless the local jurisdiction has requested and obtained this authority and responsibility. Very few have. There's a few counties that have, and I think one city is, uh, has or is applying, and that would be the city of Gonzales. I'm not sure if they've succeeded. Uh, but this is generally done at the state level. Uh, our last forum had members from the housing community development, or had a member from the housing community development department uh, and explained that process in quite a bit of detail. The permits are issued for, on an annual basis. So if you get one, uh, it's just, it has to be renewed every single year. And it does require a land use permit or a zoning clearance from a local jurisdiction if that is required. Uh, presently, that's not required in San Marino. So, as I said, the uh, HCD issues the permits annually. They're responsible for enforcement of violations. And the city or the county of jurisdiction approves the zoning. Now, one exception, the Employee Housing Act provides a specific exemption for the use of a single family home serving six or fewer uh, employees. That is considered a residential property use, the same as any other residential property use. It must be treated the same. So if six people that live together in a family or six students can rent a house together uh, and uh, be treated uh, as an appropriate use, six, employee, six employees provided uh, housing under this program have to be allowed to live in the house as well. That's in a situation where the state has preempted local authority and control. Local authorities can't regulate any differently than that. Hmm? Yeah, sorry, sorry if I, I meant six or less. And those are the sections. Uh, theoretical, obviously that means that they can't. Some places they have eight or ten or more. Well, we don't, the local jurisdictions have the ability to regulate seven or more, but the city of San Maria does not do that at the present time. And, and certainly more than six people can live in a house, uh, but it's, that's a specific requirement of uh, employee housing. So anyway, those are the statutes that uh, control. Okay, now some of these are uh, federal requirements, and 
think some of them are, might be state law requirements, but these are the housing requirements for employee housing. 50 square feet of bedroom space or sleeping space must be allowed per employee in a sleeping room. There must be a fully equipped kitchen and common area, or three meals a day must be provided. Now, the employees can be charged for the meals if, they, if the employer decides to do that. If the, the amount is not that much, and Carlos can provide that information. It's, uh, it, it's a, a challenge for the people who provide the food to do it in a way that uh, is profitable for them and provide some variety to the, uh, the recipients. Uh, so now, this was interesting, an oven is not required. A stovetop or a burner unit uh, is all that's required for the kitchen. A refrigerator must be provided. There must be bathroom and laundry facilities with a laundry tub and at least one shower head per 10 house workers, which I think most people feel that's not enough, but that's what the state, that's what the requirements are. Must be fire extinguishers and ladders in a two-story building. Okay, those are basic requirements. According to our best estimates, there are 2,691 HOA workers uh, that reside in the county of Santa Barbara during fiscal year July 2016 through June 2017. And the city of Santa Maria housed about 1,700 of those workers, um, 900 of which were housed in residential dwellings and about 800 in the, like the hotels and motels on, on Broadway and, and Main Street. The 900, we don't have the, break, the number broken down to how many were in R3 or R1 or R2. And for those who don't understand what that means, R1 is typical single family residential house in a low density neighborhood. R2 is kind of what they call medium density. You see a lot of duplexes and triplexes in R2 neighborhoods. And then R3 are high density, and that's where you see apartment buildings often. And that is it for my presentation, my overview. I'm happy to take some quick questions before turning it over to the panel. For I think most of you have seen that before, so there probably shouldn't be too many. Oh, great. No questions. All right. At this time, I am going to turn it over to, to Laura Brown. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to do a, a quick self-introduction here. My name is Laura Brown. I work for the California Strawberry Commission. This is a statewide grower. It's a trade association. Well, it's not a trade association. It's just actually a state government entity representing all of California's uh, strawberry growers, shippers, and processors. And my name is Claire Weinman. I'm the president of the Grower Shipper Association of Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with our association, um, we're a local a nonprofit organization and we have three types of members. We have farmers, farm labor contractors, and supporting members. And we really focus on local policy issues um, at the local and regional level. Uh, Mr. Singer did a wonderful job of giving an overview of a lot of the H2A logistics. As you can tell, they are plentiful. Uh, it's a lot to take in, into mind when someone contemplates utilizing this program. Um, but we did want to emphasize a few of the points, um, just to make sure, especially issues that were covered in the previous meeting with the regulatory agencies. And so um, I'll start off here with, with something very basic. Uh, in order to utilize the H2A program, you must be able to demonstrate that the labor pool is not large enough to pull from domestically. So that's a very important point to make. That's your key access to utilizing an H2A visa. Uh, the program is designed to ensure the domestic workers are not harmed. Also, this is a higher rate of pay. So when you think about it, that's actually more of a disincentive to utilize the H-2A program. And the H-2A program wasn't created at the federal level to be an easy option for growers. Um, you know, it's, it's more of a, a last resort for growers to use. And these are jobs that are not being taken by domestic employees. As, as Mr. Sinko mentioned, there's a lot of opportunity afforded for domestic employees to have these jobs. So ultimately, when you think about it, in a way, this could drive 
of wages. And, and you have to keep in mind that agriculture as a whole is paying a higher, a higher wage for the hourly employee than most other industries to stay competitive for the agricultural community. These are, I won't hit this one too hard because you just saw a lot of information on this, but there are very restrictive uh, program requirements. So the housing specifications are very strict. Uh, transportation, um, growers are required to offer transportation um, on a weekly basis to grocery stores, to laundry facilities, to work sites, to and from um, your, your location of employment. Uh, also, health care, that was an issue that came up at a previous meeting. Uh, all H-2A employees are afforded the same opportunity to health care as all the domestic employees. So this is employer-provided health insurance. And keep in mind that all employers are required by, by law to provide workers' comp, and not to mention they're eligible for emergency Medi-Cal services. So as you can see, this is a permanency program. And it's not something that a grower would do. Almost all of their other options have been exhausted. So we really appreciate the opportunity to address some of the questions that we've heard and to provide some information on how the program works and what H2A and what agriculture means to our community in Santa Maria. And as Laura uh, and Mr. Sinko were saying, one of the biggest features of the H2A program is how many steps there are. Um, and that process is designed to protect our community and both our local and our guest workers. And so I'd like to talk a little bit more about what some of those protections for the community and for the workers are. As mentioned, the H2A program is regulated by both state and federal agencies. At the federal level, some of the major parties are the U.S. Department of Labor, which certifies an employer's application. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security reviews an employer's petition and reviews the worker's entry at the border. And the U.S. Department of State considers whether to issue a visa to a potential guest worker. And we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. At the state level, the major parties implementing the h 2 program include the California Employment Development Department, which helps to recruit domestic workers and also helps with housing inspections. Additionally, the California Department of Housing and Community Development focuses on housing for the guest workers. In previous town halls, we've also heard questions about protections for both guest workers and for domestic employees. Again, some of the protections for guest workers um, are that the employers must comply with all applicable laws and regulations. That means health and safety regulations. That means overtime payment provisions. That means workers' compensation insurance. That means all the local, state, and federal worker protections that would be required for any employee are applicable to our guest workers. In California, we definitely are very protective of employees and have a very extensive review and regulatory program to make sure that, that not only are the laws on the books, but they're also being enforced. Employers must post a financial bond, and the employees, on their end, are free to terminate their contract at any time. There was a discussion about the positive recruitment of domestic employees. Um, so you might have seen the ads in the San Maria Times that were mentioned. It's in the health wanted section, and, and it's mentioned that specific information needed to be included, including the period of employment, the number of employees that are being sought, um, the job duties that would be included in that. So um, if you do see it in the paper, that's what it's for. Um, and again, that's to first give every opportunity for our domestic employees to fill those positions uh, if they are ready, willing, and able to do so. Um, I'll mention it just one more time that the adverse effect wage rate um, that's published by the U.S. Department of Labor for the h 2 program is set to protect domestic employees performing similar job functions. 
This is the way to ensure that there are no more domestic workers that are willing, ready, and able to perform the job functions before bringing in guest workers. There are also further protections for domestic employees performing what's called corresponding employment. Um, and again, that's to make sure that the wages and working conditions of similarly employed domestic employees are protected. And again, we just wanted to summarize once again some of the most important issues that we've heard in previous town hall discussions in ways that our communities and workers are protected <coughs> and focus on some of the, and now I'd like to focus on some more of the details of the H-2A housing requirements. So for those employees who cannot reasonably return to their permanent residence at the end of the day, the employers to provide that housing free of charge to the employee. And the employer must provide by all applicable local, state, and federal rules and regulations. And that includes fairly comprehensive um, housing specifications that are set by the U.S. Department of Labor and the California Department of Housing and Community Development. Housing is then inspected by the California Department of Housing and Community Development and the EED. This is a sample to one of the guides for employee housing inspections that's put out jointly by the U.S. Department of Labor and the California Department of Housing and Community Development. It's very comprehensive, it's about 15 pages long, and has very, very detailed requirements. Some of the areas that it includes, um, includes cooking or kitchen if, that facility, if those facilities are provided, um, enforcement and penalties, fire safety, first aid, garbage, hand washing, bathing, laundry, heating, lighting, postings, screens, toilets, and water supplies. So again, it's very detailed in terms of what the requirements are for the housing that's provided by the employees, and that is a part of the housing inspections that are conducted. Here you can see an example of a strawberry grower timeline and, and all the thought that goes into the planning process for a strawberry field in any given year. Um, and before, the very first date is August, 2000, is August 2018, so in this case this year. But actually about a year prior to this, Growers are already having conversations with landlords and negotiating their leases and their contracts for the land. In addition, the strawberry growers have to tell the nurseries what kind of plants they want so the nurseries know how many of what variety of strawberries to plant in order to harvest them and get them to the strawberry growers in time for the winter planting season. So, long story short, it takes several years in order to plan for any one given year. So there's a lot of time and energy that's put into the planning process. And to outline um, just the short-term process, really, you begin in, in August. That might be a typical time for a strawberry grower to, to take over a piece of land and begin their lease and begin their land prep. And, and then you go into October, because we're speaking specifically about H2A in this process, that at this point is when you're going to be planting your strawberries. So right now, that's why you're seeing the plastic tarts out there and, and maybe not too many berries in the ground, but you're going to start seeing the crews out there planting the, the berry, um, the rootstock here pretty soon. Um, at this time is also when growers who are planning to utilize the H2A visa program are going to be looking for housing. So if they haven't done so already, because some people have been doing this for a few years and they have long-term contracts um, established with uh, different housing options, but by about this time through December is when you'll start to see the housing decisions will be finalized, leases signed and such. Going into February through September, that's a large span of time, is when, is when you begin the recruitment of domestic employees. Because you need to begin recruiting domestic employees before uh, you would apply for the visas. And then also, as Claire mentioned earlier, as Mr. Singh, 
that you're also offering opportunities for the domestic employees to take these jobs all the way through 50% of the season at the time that you're utilizing the visa. About March, and then again, this is gonna vary a little bit. This is gonna depend on when a company is going to need their employees. But for this conversation, say in March, is when the grower and employer is going to ask, um, is going to submit their visa application to DOL. And then remember, it's about a 45-day timeline. They can do it no, no sooner than 45 days. So in this case, by April, H-2A employees would arrive ready for work. And that's assuming that there were no complications, because there can be any number of reasons for complications to happen in that small period of window. And I'm seeing some growers in this room nodding their heads. Um, then we also have in November, we'll see more or less is maybe when you're gonna see all of the employees will have gone back to their, their home um, of their home of origin. So for this purpose. And we also see a lot of individuals are returning employees and they develop relationships with their with their employers with the H-2A program. And so a lot of times I've even heard um, in the recruitment process, you, you hope to get the same people back because you already have a trained workforce. And so if the same people are, are coming back, then it makes it a smoother process. You also know there won't be any complications with the visa process. So everything that they can do to make it smoother, and I know that that's a huge um, incentive right now. So um, I think that's that's about it. Unless anyone has any questions about how long it takes to plan for strawberries. Okay. Next slide. Um, I know we just have said a lot of things about how this can be a rather inflexible program, but everywhere that there is a little bit of flexibility, it's nice to have that option because it is very difficult to secure housing on the Central Coast in, in any situation. Um, and the housing, the rigid housing requirements that are required through DOL, through the visa program, and also through HCD, EDD, um, ensures that all the housing for H-2A workers is well maintained. And we did want to include the quote at the bottom um, regarding the city's satisfaction with the hotel utilization here in the city of San Luis. And if I may, I have a couple slides here regarding um, agriculture's importance to the city of San Maria. Uh, here, uh, we can think of many nonprofits throughout the town that have grower board members. There's support for all the nonprofits, volunteers, uh, growers that encourage employees to participate in their community. Uh, these growers are financially supportive of charities. I think we can all think of events that we've gone through and we've seen support from the agriculture community. And they freely give up donations of product. I know that um, we used to quote here from our local food bank, a lot of strawberries are donated to the local food bank. Um, and then there's also this afternoon, uh, one of our growers was recognized by the Boys and Girls Club. And so straight from the headlines of the San Maria News Press is, um, is that other item. And so these are ultimately, the, these are civically minded individuals who are interested in the well-being of their communities. They're very invested in these communities being vibrant and, and healthy. And then there's also the other item that growers derive a lot of joy from. Uh, they don't consider farming a job. They consider it a lifestyle. And they take a lot of pride in being able to feed their communities, the state of California, and even the nation. Uh, California strawberry industry takes a lot of pride in the fact that we provide over 80% of the nation's fresh strawberries. Uh, when you're on the East Coast and you're looking for strawberries, they're going to have a label that says Santa Maria, Watsonville, or Oxnard. It's also important to note uh, that taxes are, are 
They're seen here in the community. Dollars are reinvested into the city of Santa Maria. The agriculture economy supports businesses as well as local, local youth and community nonprofits. And the tax base is essential for services such as recreation, fire, police, public services, schools. And H2 employee, employees are spending their money here. I've heard that brought up at previous meetings. Uh, if, if you give growers an opportunity at the end of the meeting, I'm sure that they can give you a lot of examples of the items that people are purchasing, not only for their use here while they're living in California, but also to take back home uh, to Mexico. to address is what is agriculture's relationship with the city of Santa Maria. And we'd like to point out that agriculture is the number one contributor to the county's economy. This comes from the Santa Barbara County Crop Report that our county agricultural commissioner puts together and has gathered different information. Um, and wanted to take an opportunity to share a little bit about some of the crops that we grow and what agriculture looks like on the central coast and specifically in the Santa Maria Valley. So when we look through, this is from the most recent, the 2017, uh, what we call Agricultural Production Report or Crop Report. Um, these are the top 10 strawberries. I'd really like to emphasize that this is gross value. These are gross numbers, so not what people are bringing home. This is not how much we are making. Uh, this is, yeah, it would be nice. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, it would. Uh, unfortunately, these are gross dollars, um, dollar values. So we want to make sure that that point is absolutely clear. This is gross value. But when we look at this list of top 10 crops, the overwhelming majority of them are grown in the Santa Maria Valley. Some of these contributions are coming from the Lompoc Valley and other areas, but the vast majority is here from the Santa Maria Valley. They include strawberries, broccoli, um, we do have some wine grapes, um, we do have some nursery products, cauliflower, head lettuce, um, there are some cut flowers in the Santa Maria Valley as well, um, celery, raspberries, and leaf lettuce are the top 10 crops in Santa Barbara County. The other thing that's really special about this is the diversity of crops that are being grown. We're not just relying on one single thing, um, and that helps to have a more healthy economy, so that if one particular crop, like let's say romaine, is maybe having a rough year, um, then you can supplement that and support our farming families and our community with other crops and other sources of income. So that diversification is very important. And Laura's going to talk about this a little bit more, but you'll also see that these are all uh, what they call specialty crops, or fruits and vegetables, and I think that's really important too. And so just wanted to point out, again, these are all things that are good for you um, in addressing and feeding our families, that are addressing healthful, nutritious food um, so that we can make sure that our families are nourished with these healthy crops. So we're very privileged to be um, in a place where we're, we're growing these beautiful crops um, that are nourishing our families and our economy. So again, all of this information is from the crop report um, that our Ag Commissioner put out. But when we look at the total impact, um, so there's the direct impact, and then there's the total impact. And so through what's called the multiplier effect, um, agriculture provides 25,000 jobs and contributes a total to $2.8 billion to the local economy. And so when we talk about the multiplier effect, it's how those dollars are, are spent again. So I get paid and I don't feel like cooking tonight so I take the family out to eat in a restaurant. Or um, it's, it's how every all the employees, how these companies are using and spending their money and supporting all of these services. Here's a few more specific examples of Santa Maria businesses that are supported um, directly and indirectly by local agriculture. So in terms of direct support, it's the things that you would think about. The irrigation suppliers, the fertilizer suppliers, um, the carton companies, the cooling um, facilities, the tractor sales companies. But it's also other companies like auto dealers for any employee or employer provided vehicles. Um, you're purchasing those, you're maintaining those, and that's all happening in the city of Santa Maria. Restaurants, we mentioned that, um, both for social, but also for a lot of business functions, taking clients out to eat or taking employees out to eat, um, providing lunches for your employees. Hotels, 
This is important not only for our, our guests that are visiting um, for business purposes and industry events, but also conferences that are um, being hosted here locally as well. Out of our membership, I mentioned that we have associate members, and in terms of numbers, they're about equal with our numbers of members who are growing, and that's because they're interdependent with agriculture. The majority of agriculture is finance, and so we have a lot of uh, supporting members uh, who work in the banks and finance industry, and also insurance sales um, and products. There's legal and accounting support that goes into that as well. Um, fuel and propane suppliers, grocery stores, laundromats, um, utility bills, tire stores. Um, these are all companies that are interdependent with the well-being of agriculture and that are conducting business in the city of Santa Maria and that are interdependent with the well-being of agriculture. This is a quote from the, one of the hotels about how important um, agriculture is to, to their particular hotel's success um, and how strong their relationship is with their local strawberry growers. The other thing that I wanted to mention too is that agriculture has different cycles from other industries. Um, you know, we, we all experience the challenge in, in um, you know, the latest recession and what that meant. But agriculture tends to have different good times and bad times. And so, again, talking about that diversification and that robustness for our communities, um, it's, you know, we don't want to be like Detroit, where you're so dependent on one single industry. So agriculture provides an important resilience and important difference in terms of when it's having good times and when it's having challenging times. And so that's something that through this latest recession, um, agriculture was still having a very strong period. Which leads us to a little bit more about the H-2A guest worker visa program. And if I may take credit for that picture. <laughs> it is local. Uh, so Claire alluded to this and introduced this subject. Um, specialty crops is something so unique for California. If I get a little political on you, the rest of the world, when they think of agriculture, at least in the United States, they think of those, those big commodity crops. Um, in the Midwest that are very um, mechanized and they need very little labor and they don't really know what to do with us in California because we grow so many different crops. This beautiful land that we live in and the Mediterranean climate makes us just very well suited for growing the crops that you see right now. Um, strawberries will not be able to be grown in very many areas of the United States as well as we do it here. This is the best place to do it in the United States. Um, and same with our leafy greens, the wines um, in the Central Valley, some of those commodity, those specialty crops, it's all very unique. The growers are growing what they're growing here on the Central Coast for, for very good reasons. This is the best place to do what they are doing right now. They're very delicate products, and because they are delicate, they require more hand labor. Um, and mechanical harvest or other technology is really not a widespread option at this time. Uh, a lot of research, uh, a lot of funding has gone into what mechanization could look like for specialty crops, but we are a long way off from that. But when we talk about other other industries that agriculture is is investing in. I mean, we can their relationships with Silicon Valley. There's a lot of different collaboration that is taking place right now in the world of agriculture. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the seasonality of agriculture. Uh, I have pulled from our Strawberry Commission website. There is no here. So we've got a three-year average by the districts. And so in, stra in the strawberry world, we talk about our, our districts. And three main districts are going to be in the Salinas, Watsonville area, which produces probably about 50%, if not more, of California strawberries. 
The green you see here, that's going to be our Oxnard Ventura area production. And then the red is Santa Maria. And you'll see that there are very specific peaks for each of these. Um, Santa Maria is blessed to be eccentric and is able to span due to technology. You might see hoops in certain areas. And a lot depends on the good graces of Mother Nature and what she'll allow, how long a growing season might last, um, or if there'll be any eruptions due to storm or weather events. But you can see there are very specific peaks, and these peaks mean that we have an increased need for, for labor. And that is why the H-2A program is utilized in, in our industry to help supplement our labor need during these peaks, because if strawberries are left in the field, this is a plant that needs to be harvested about three times a week. If it's not harvested, it, the berries themselves might leave room for, for disease problems, and, and then you have pest invasion, that will cause a problem. But remember, these are plants that we need to produce for most of the year. And so if the plant is not healthy, then it won't be able to continue to produce. And so if we are set back in labor, then that means these plants won't be healthy because those rotten, overripe berries have to be taken off. And when you're taking overripe berries off of plants, growers are not receiving any income for that. That's a net loss. That means the labor crew is out there harvesting berries that they cannot market. So part of the reason that we're all here today is because the Santa Maria area has been experiencing a labor shortage. Have any of you heard about it or familiar with the labor shortage? Okay, all right. Good. Um, you know, these were numbers that, the, the issue started in about 2011 or 2012, and our members, um, we've locally conducted a survey of our members, and it's, um, it's not a formal peer review survey, um, but it is a good informational sense. And also the California Farm Bureau Federation has conducted similar um, surveys in the past. But our members have consistently been reporting in the range of 15 to 25% shortages. And that's the percent of currently available positions that our members have been reporting. These have resulted in dramatic um, lost opportunities in revenue. Um, the numbers, and, and these are very difficult numbers to estimate. Um, but the numbers that we've gotten back from our members um, have ranged in $4 million to $13 million or more per year, and that's in lost revenue. I mean, that's gross revenue, that's not net revenue that people are bringing home. Uh, but again, these are very significant um, losses and opportunities that our members have reported. One of the questions that we hear um, has to do with increasing wages, and unfortunately, increased wages has not helped to alleviate the, wage sh the labor shortage. Um, yeah, that's another misconception. There have been increases in wages, and as Laura mentioned, the prevailing wage in agriculture does tend to be higher um, to, in hopes to attract and retain. Um, but I think if somebody put it bluntly that if we could pay more, we would, uh, but it hasn't helped. Our members have reported that the labor shortage has somewhat um, alleviated this past year, and we're not clear if that's due to the utilization of the H-2A program or if there was other variability in that particular survey um, or other um, labor assisting uh, efficiencies. And so we'll be looking for that um, to see if, there, if that trend has continued to improve. But even last year, it was still in about a 15 to 20 percent um, shortage that our members have been experiencing. This is ongoing, severe, dramatic labor shortage. Unfortunately, this issue isn't unique just to agriculture. Uh, in California, um, or to agriculture in general, I don't know if I uh, was preparing for this and happened to see the KCOI um, article on uh, Santa Maria employers struggling to find workers, and, and it happened to be of Kind of the seasonal food service, retail, and hospitality industries, uh, but you could have just as easily inserted agriculture. It seems like there's a lot of um, different job types and locations that are also um, looking at, at finding people who are ready, willing, and able um, 
to work with as well. So again, just wanted to emphasize that, that there has been coverage that even though it is certainly a prominent feature in agriculture, it's not unique to agriculture either. Uh, really quickly, we try and determine why is there a labor shortage. And so really concisely, I'm going to point out three, three items that there seems to be mainstream consensus on. Um, there are changing patterns of border enforcement. It's also probably one of the most dangerous and expensive times to cross the border illegally right now. Uh, there are reports of a declining birth rate in Mexico, in addition to the current labor force here is getting older. Also, the improving economy in Mexico is certainly another option, that individuals are finding it easier to find professional work over in Mexico. I think we're going to, to hit this point again about the seasonality need. And I want to explain and give a couple of examples regarding this. Uh, the H Street program is in no way meant to limit options for the domestic workforce. Um, if anything, the domestic workforce has the ability to move freely from employer to employer, from commodity to commodity, and, and do as, as they wish at any given time. Uh, when individuals with H-2A program are contracted with an employer, they're often needed for seasonal or short-term needs. Um, an example of this is in the middle of a strawberry, heart, uh, in the middle of a strawberry season, there is a need for growers to conduct crop maintenance, or in other words, kind of an intensive mid-season time to clean up the plants and, and make sure that they're they're healthy so they can produce for as long as they possibly can. But if this is happening at the same time that we're at peak peace rate, the domestic labor force is going to want to work to get the highest income per hour as they can. So they're going to make sure that they are working uh, in a harvest crew that's going to, with a strawberry field that is fully loaded with strawberries. So they're going to be able to pick many more boxes. And so their ability to earn income is higher than it would be if they were on a crop maintenance crew, for example. And so that is where I've seen H2A um, utilized in many cases with the strawberry industry. Uh, another example is organic crops. Right now, everyone is, is enjoying their, their organic foods, but you also have to keep in mind the realities of organic production. You can't produce as much of a quantity of a product on the same plot of land. And so the ability for employees to earn more is greater in the conventional crops where there will be more berries on a plant than it is in an organic field. And for that reason, um, the domestic workforce it, it might not want to go um, to work on an organic field. I hear that a lot, that growers have a hard time getting employees in organic fields. Uh, and also, or finding organic land because of the specifications for organically certified land is, is difficult to find. And so sometimes that plot of land might be farther away from the city center employees might not want to drive so far um, to get to work. And so those are some of the realities that we're dealing with. And so when there's, uh, when we see that there literally is not enough people, these are a couple of examples that, that you can think of. Uh, so ultimately, it, it is, this is a super competitive job market that we just don't have enough people to fill. You'll notice that our comparison of the advantages of utilizing the H-2A program and the disadvantages are, are different, correct? And there are many more disadvantages to the H-2A program than there are advantages. And growers 
the employers wouldn't be utilizing this program if that one advantage wasn't there. That advantage circumvents all of those disadvantages. So growers don't take this decision lightly at all. I, I'd like you to walk away with that message. And when you ask why are growers using the H2A program, it's because they have to. So as we're looking forward and, and trying to think, okay, where do we go from here? Um, you know, these are complex issues and we really try to uh, make it digestible and, and um, you know, but, but there are weighty issues. I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to look at each of these components in depth. Um, and there's also multiple solutions that, that we are pursuing. We are uh, looking at every tool in the toolbox and wanted to share with you what some of those are. Um, this includes H2, in the short term, um, strategies include H2A program improvements. That's something that Carlos is, I'm sure, an expert at and can maybe share some more with us. But um, it would be things like um, a few years ago when the government shut down, they weren't processing visas at all. And so um, our crops were rotting in the fields and people were waiting for their visas to be processed. Another year, it was the, um, they were having an issue with printing the visas. There was a software glitch and they weren't printing the visas. And so again, everyone, everyone was waiting. Um, we were waiting for our crops to be harvested. Employees were ready and waiting to get to work. So those would be um, minor refinements that would make a huge difference to uh, our, us as the agricultural community. And so that's um, our partners that focus more at the federal level of looking at those opportunities for improvement. Um, we continue to aggressively pursue housing solutions um, at all levels, that's in the county and the cities, um, both in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, um, looking at all angles and all opportunities. And in some cases, as Laura was mentioning, uh, looking at different compensation methods, including piece rate, can help to meet some of that. Um, demand to, to address the ongoing labor shortage. In terms of long-term strategies, um, the association and our colleagues have been supportive of a federal immigration reform program with a guest worker visa provision. Um, and also, I'm putting housing down here because it takes time. It takes a lot of time um, to get everything in line and address those um, all of the needs and there's lots of boxes to check and make sure that all the, um, everything's being complied with. And so, uh, you know, we put that down as a long-term strategy as well as we're continuing to, to pursue those solutions. Um, and then technology is a wonderful thing. There's, uh, I wanted to share an example, but I guess uh, back in, when was it, 60s or 70s, George, people used to hand walk through the fields to rubber band cauliflower leaves over the crops so that they wouldn't brown this color. Um, but over time, they've used selective plant breeding so that that naturally will cover and protect the plant. And so that's an example of how using technology can help to assist um, that. There's also been increased utilization in machine-assisted harvest. We're a long ways out from being replaced, um, but that's something that is being researched is to what extent can you use um, machinery to, to conduct that, but that's many years out. Whereas in the medium term, maybe we, there's some opportunities for advancements in assisting so that it's um, more efficient. And who knows what? You know, if you would have told me that I have a mini computer sitting in my purse, uh, I probably would not have believed it when I was waiting for AOL to dial up. So um, that's that's one thing is you know, there's so much innovation um, that that we don't know what that solution is going to be like. Uh, or if I did, I would invest in it. And uh, again, we'd be making it 20 million gross dollars. Um, but as we're pursuing those solutions, um, we heard how important agriculture is to our community in Santa Maria. And right now, each two is the only viable option <coughs> to address the slave shortage as we work towards more permanent solutions. And it's absolutely essential to keeping agriculture viable in Santa Maria. And a part of that is a variety of housing solutions to meet those diverse needs. So with that, we thank you for your support of agriculture. We thank you for the opportunity to share with you some more information um, and look forward to, sh to sharing more um, with our group.
be passing the mic around. The uh, only written question I have, this one's really hot. Um, you want to ask me? Yeah, well, this was a sure old talk. <laughs> this is my question was... It's a hot mic, so keep it, keep it low. Okay. My, it, it, we're not worried about the, the employees. We know we need them. It's, a, it's where they're living. We don't believe that they should be living in single-family homes <laughs> in our neighborhoods. With, you know, they don't, the owners might care, but the people living in there are, could be perfect people, I'm not saying, but they don't take interest in our neighborhood. They don't invest into our neighborhoods. They don't have families where we watch them grow. Our neighborhood has been almost all together for 25 years. Almost all of us still live in that neighborhood. You know, and the people that have moved in have started are investing in it also. When you have H2A in your neighborhood, they don't invest in it. They're there to work. I'm not saying anything about that. But they're not there to invest. We need to find a situation where they can be with all of them together, where they can work together, play together, have a place where they can go out and play soccer, run, whatever. But they need some place else besides a home. A, 1,100 square foot house is not big enough for 10 men. Hi, Cheryl. Hello. Um, it's nice to see you. We know that this issue is really important to you, and we're, we appreciate your participation in the town halls and um, would like the opportunity if we can share a little bit more information and maybe some of our um, employers who are here can address some of your concerns too. So we hear you and I think it's that passion for our community and for our homes that makes Santa Maria so wonderful and so vibrant and we share that with you. So thank you for your passion. Uh, Carlos, do you want to take a stab at this one? Because you, you have some other, you have many different what? housing arrangements that how's your Sure, sure. Uh, and thank you, Cheryl. I, I, I had the opportunity to speak with you at some of the other town halls. And uh, first, I think I, I, I'd like to apologize to Cheryl on behalf of, of you know, a labor contractor that they could have done a much better job of being a better neighbor to you and, and, and heard your concerns. I do have to say that they have come and apologized, and they are keeping it up, and they are, they are going to be there next year. They've already came and told us that. But it, I'm not just looking for our street. This is for all of Santa Maria. Yeah, this is for all of Santa Maria. Not just the, the more I've talked out, and you don't know how this is not up my alley. I am not good at this. More people have come to say, we didn't realize. We're noticing it here. We're, this isn't, people don't, they won't speak up. But they don't like it in their neighborhood. When they buy a house, they want it for their families, and they want families around them. Uh, you know, and I know you guys have a hard time finding a place, and I can totally understand that. But that's what I'm saying. We need to find something, come to a common ground or something <coughs> that for the families and the workers. I I, I agree 100. percent I think that we're all working collectively to try to find a solution that is fitting for the residents both H-Story residents and, and the community of Santa Maria. And that's why we're hosting the, the, the town hall meetings. But we keep going around and around in circles. I know. Are you going to give me the mic? You're going to engage in the talk. Uh, is there anyone else that has any questions? I see someone in the back. Uh, what I, I was getting at, this is a really hot mic. Uh, what I was getting at, Carlos, is you, uh, there are other options for housing other than single family homes. And I was hoping that you might share uh, some ideas about that, if you can. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, we've been trying to work with the, the city of Santa Maria to, to identify locations where there's something that, that, um, that can be built. It's acceptable to the community, that would work, that would have the amenities that you're describing. And it, it's quite a challenge, right? Because uh, you see it's a rather large investment, something 
Well, I'm, I'm okay. most people's ballpark, right? And so trying to find something that fits or set up a partnership amongst strangers, if you will, different growers, but forcing them in a partnership. So we, we've been we've been attacking this at many angles, trying to find a solution to this. And, 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 and the city assembly has been fantastic. They've been very open to ideas and suggestions. Um, I know they've allowed this uh, use in hotels, and uh, we're certainly continuing to to all that one stone, uh, you know, turn. We're, we're looking at everything and, and trying to find a solution, a more long-term solution. So we're very sympathetic to the concerns of the community, and um, we want to find a solution to this. Thanks, Carlos. <clears throat> My name is Karen Schindler, and I'm actually an agent. <clears throat> Excuse me, I represent some of the employers and contractors, H2A employers and contractors. Um, I'm new to the area. I just moved from Washington, D.C. about two years ago. Um, don't hold that against me, please. <laughs> but I do have a question. So this is kind of new to me. Um, we're talking about the H2A workers coming into neighborhoods and you know, moving, I totally understand. I don't think I want a bunch of guys moving into my neighborhood. But my question is, where are the temporary workers being housed that are not H2A workers currently? Because if there's a shortage of workers, you know, that's increasing obviously year by year, there's gotta be a gap that's being filled obviously with H2A workers. So where, I don't understand why there's a problem now than you know, several years ago with you know farm workers living in the neighborhoods. I'm afraid that I may have to answer that one. Uh, to some extent, we we have we've always had farm workers living in family housing. Uh, that's normal, and, and that's really not what the issue was. The issue arose because of the increase in. H2A moving into what the R1 neighborhood mostly uh, it made its initial. We first became aware of it. Uh, there was a mention of the, the hotel that was converted. Um, that was where they, uh, the, the, we first realized there was a large number of H2A workers coming into the city of San Maria. And from the city's perspective, especially the code compliance perspective, that was a welcome thing. The hotel that was purchased by the farm. Farming, uh, the agricultural operation was was a, was a terrible situation. It was full of crime ridden. There was 300 calls for service a month there, and when it was sold, that went to zero, and the property was cleaned up. And I think a lot of the workers initially went into the hotels on Broadway. The stat that I showed earlier showed 800 of them were living there, uh, 900 in various. Residential neighborhoods, and like I said, we don't know the exact configuration, how many are one, are two, and are three. But it wasn't until recently where the number in the residential neighborhoods came up, probably because the initial hotels started, this, the availability was, was lessened. But I could let one of the other panelists answer that question um, if they know. She did ask the question of, she did ask the question of, where are the non H2A farm workers living and do you know where they are? That, that is the answer for anybody. All over Santa Maria. Basically. Do you, do you control that? Basically, we don't control any of that. They live with it wherever they wish, and that's always been the case. I think what, um, coming from DC, you may not realize, because I've been back to DC many times lobbying in this case. And they don't really understand in the East that it took a steady flow of people coming in here for the last 50 years. And when that flow got cut off, um, you know, it wasn't like all these people came here and then, you know, that was kind of what happened, you know, way back when in the, in the you know, uh, the um, Acero program. It, it was a steady stream for 50 years. I mean, that's how the city of Los Angeles is half the span. Now, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> if you're last to understand these things, you know, don't uh, happen overnight. It was a long period, and now the border got closed. So now we don't have that steady stream. Agriculture was generally a training ground. They came in here, good family would move on to be, you know, look at Abel Maldonado, look at, you know, a lot of people that have been through, you know, been here, uh, come as, 
immigrants or, or illegally or legally and moved on. But as, as we all know in this country, we don't raise our children to be harvest workers. That generally isn't the, the goal. And so, yes, there's a lot of them and they can make better wages now because there's a lot of peace rates and they're doing much better. But if we want to be competitive with other countries, this is what we're gonna have to do. We have to solve this issue. And I think um, the wages and living conditions are better than they ever have been. But um, for our economy, for the, the domestic workers to, to have better, you know, for our economy, economy to keep thriving um, and have those high, high labor jobs that we have here in Santa Rita, many other areas have automated. Yeah, but I don't see us automating. I, I, anyway, I'll wait till it's my turn to talk. And I'll do it. This, this might tag on to a little bit of what George just said, but I just want to reiterate an important point. Um, there aren't necessarily, there aren't more acres going into production. So that the need for agricultural workers and the number of workers we need isn't increasing, if that makes sense. But say we've been talking this evening about a labor shortage. So I'm going to use an example with completely inaccurate numbers. If you need 100 people to harvest um, over at Ranch A, but you are short 20 people, so you bring in 20 people from H2A the next year. So you still have 100 farm workers. It just means that 80 of them are from the domestic workforce and 20 of them are from the H2A visa program. So the amount of farm workers needed we, we've seen really steady in the last few years. And if anything, some of the technology that Claire mentioned as she was closing, that there are technologies to kind of improve efficiencies, um, those kinds of things will continue to grow. And I expect that we'll need fewer and fewer people per acre as time goes on. And, and who knows, it's a pipe dream um, possibly, but you know, who, if at one point, harvesting is mechanized, then, then that's a completely different game. But again, we're a long way off from that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit more um, real numbers. And I, I certainly appreciate Cheryl's passion for coming forward and spending the time to come to all these meetings. But she mentioned that 10 people, 10 men living in an 1,100 square foot home is too many. And I, and I think if I remember correctly, Carlos agreed with her. I can't conceive of a normally constructed 1,100 square foot home that would legally house, under the rules and regulations, 10 people. I'm not saying that 10 people aren't living there, but if they are, all likelihood is they're living there outside of the restrictions of H2A. So that brings me to this question, and I'd like to be answered by somebody that's dealing locally. If you have a violation, or a violation is alleged, I'd like to know what's done on the local level to resolve that issue. And let's take the actual situation that Cheryl's talking about. Well, 10 workers living in an 1,100 square foot home, somebody's got to do something. What, what would that process be? And if there's no problem found, then obviously the end result is nothing happens, nothing additional happens. But if there is a problem found, either with the workers or with the H2A um, uh, uh, management person or something, what are the repercussions for those two groups, the workers and the H2A uh, uh, provider. Can somebody answer that? Because I think I think I know the answer, but I think it's maybe some people don't in the room. And, and we need to get that out there on how severe it is and the cost factors associated with it. And I'll let my colleagues add something if they'd like, but uh, certainly when we're talking about um, you know, what, what's appropriate, it, it really depends on the specifics of, of the situation and um, 
you know, if, if you have a two-bedroom house, that's different from a five-bedroom house, um, and what's you know, what's going to go along with that. Um, but in terms of some of the, the specifics, um, you know, certainly if there is a code enforcement issue, that could be one potential resolution depending on what the issue is. Um, one could also file a complaint with the Housing and Community Development Department, um, or ADD, uh, who again have very important roles in inspecting um, the housing. And there's also program requirements. So employers can be found um, that, that on their end uh, that they haven't consistently fulfilled um, certain important components of the program, and they could be debarred from utilizing the program through the Sure, how much we elaborated on the dimensions. <coughs> for ATD during the inspection, it's 50 square feet of bedroom space. So, so it's not divided by 1,100 square feet of, of, of the actual home's uh, footprint. It's a, a bedroom space. So I think that's a big misconception where people feel that you have a huge house. Um, in historic Sanity has very nice homes, but do remember those, those bedrooms are they're very small. On, on average, 8 by 10. Let's just say they're huge. 10 by 12 is probably the biggest I've seen. That's 120 square feet. That's, that's two people in each one of those bedrooms. So if that's a two bedroom home or a three bedroom home, that might be four or six people. So if there is more people than that and more than HCD and approved, then someone's violating the, the, uh, the inspection, the approval of the HCD. I mean, from what I've seen in my experience in maintaining you know, you've got guys that are coming from basically a third world country, and a lot of it is maintaining the hygiene. You're having to train them, just like anything. To me, it's it's more of maintaining that, and that's what is inspected. It's inspected every year at the beginning, and then one time during the season, sometimes you know, random inspections. But it's like anything. It's like maintaining any any facility anywhere and that's up to the owners and um, you know, so typically the the enforcement is you know maintaining that standard the health standard and that's that, from my experience that's basically what it is just like at the city there's if everything is if you're not infringing outwardly on residents and it's not impacting residents and your neighbors everybody has to have an outward look at how they do things, and, and historically, if we don't do anything as growers here, we have to be very respectful of our neighbors, and, and that's why we, you know, we discuss this at length with everyone in the grower community. I mean, this, this needs to be resolved. I just wanted to add something about that. That was a question I had that was answered the last one, whether a living room could be used as a sleeping room or it can only be bedrooms. And that was answered. The uh, HCD takes the position that the building code requires, uh, defines a dwelling unit as a living, place for eating, and sleeping. So you need all three components. <coughs> now, the line does get blurry if there's a living room, a dining room, say two bedrooms, and a family room or a converted patio that's been converted into a family room. They will recognize that as a sleeping room uh, so that you can get additional people. But if it's a normal bedroom, like a three-bedroom house, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that was, you cannot walk through a bedroom. That's correct, that's correct. That's oh, that's the other thing. So the, the truth is that under the H2A program, occupancy limits are actually more restrictive than state law. So if you, we did, code enforcement got a, a call about, I think it was 12 people living in a, in a house, and first call I made was to HCE to see if it was an H2A house, and it was not. So looked at the house, the size of it, like, okay, maybe 12 people can't fit in there, uh, but we didn't really have any uh, cause to go in. Uh, the person was claiming that it's an H2A house out of compliance, and it wasn't, so we didn't pursue the case. There's a question there? Uh, two questions that may concern the non-hotel. Um, site settings of H2A. Since H2A is really seasonal and looks like strawberries about eight months, that's accurate. Typically, there's a housing that you have that um, growers and contractors have. Does it go vacant during the other months? 
then the biggest question, does anybody have a sense of how much more HOA housing is even needed in our, you know, in our region? Maybe like to answer Scott's question? Sure. I know the focus on today's presentation, being the strawberries we're presenting here, uh, was reflective of, of strawberries. But we also have to keep in mind that uh, this is also a big vegetable uh, uh, valley. And vegetables use the program for up to 10 months. And so it, the entry first question, sir, is, is yes, there would be two months of vacancy in, in, in those units. Just getting back to the, the labor, it's a labor need issue. Like we have a big range of crops. One of the um, interesting, that graph that Laura had up there that had the two peaks in Santa Maria. Well, those are very close to the two peaks when there's planting as well. And that's what makes Santa Maria different than any other district. And that, that yeah, that one right there. If you look at the peak of the red in the spring, is when a lot of times the summer plants, you have a double need for labor, which complicates the matter even further. And that other one, right, like currently right now, what I want to talk about is the need for um, labor at this time of the year. We're trying to get across celery harvesting, and it's warm. We have a decent market. We, we have, you know, we're going to sustain a fairly large economic hit if we can't get everything harvested in a timely manner prior to Thanksgiving. So a lot of people don't understand a lot of these dynamics that, that go into economic loss. So yes, you're still going to make money, but if you can make more money, then you can afford to pay people more money. And every you know, economy gets that much stronger. And you know, we didn't know that we were going to be raising Brussels sprouts three years ago. We didn't know that we were going to be raising as much you know, these, of the mixed crops. Kale takes a lot of labor, no way to to break it off the plant yet. And that's another thing that, so there's all these different crops that if you don't have the labor, you don't have the opportunity, if you don't have the opportunity, you can't take advantage of the markets. And that's, so, so I guess the answer to that is we don't know because I don't know what people are gonna be eating three years from now. And I don't know how, where it's gonna get grown. I don't know what areas are gonna get impacted by global warming or anything else. In other words, everything's in flux. So we don't really, um, we, we move crops around to take advantage of markets. The dovetail on that, and, and to that exact point, hearing it from a grower, that's the reason why it's so challenging to get growers to make such a large investment in, in constructing new housing, right? Because they, they don't know what it looks like three years, five years, uh, and especially not ten years from now. So it's it's uh, it's quite a challenge to, to, to go sign on that dotted line with the local bank to, to, to make a huge investment and not know if there's going to be a need for it. We've talked a lot about, um, one of the things that I wanted to add, um, we've talked a lot about kind of the harvest component, but one of the important functions of the H2A program is to be there for transplants. And much of the, or all of the strawberries are transplanted, but many of the vegetables are transplanted as well. And that is one component that's started to utilize the H2A program, uh, because if you can't get the transplants in the ground, you can't then cultivate them. There, there's some that's grown from direct seed, but again, a lot of them are being used um, the transplanting is you're competing for the same people. Um, people were wanting to, to go work in other um, employment opportunities. And so it, it is for other essential um, support services. Um, we've seen some irrigators, I think we might see an increase in utilization for irrigation as well. And so that's another um, aspect of the program that in terms of, of the number of employees isn't as great, but it is very important and an essential part of supporting our agricultural community. If a house is owned by an employer, I mean, it's, it's their discretion on, on how it's used and, you know, for how long, and, you know, it's their own employees that are coming um, there. And, and you have to keep in mind the housing inspection before the H-2A employees come. There's about two months that folks, whether they own the house or whether they're renting it, they're paying for that house to be as is for the H-2A employees before their arrival because of the inspections with HCD um, primarily or at times EDD. Um, but also because housing is so is so impacted here in Santa Maria, 
short-term rentals or subleases are, are often used. I mean, for a whole wide variety of reasons. Maybe someone sold their house and there's a few months that they need to find somewhere else to live before they move into their new house. And there haven't been problems finding subleasers so that the houses aren't remaining vacant for long periods of time. Because obviously the, the owner of the house wouldn't want that either. I mean, the second part of your question was, do we know how much, how many more H2 work, H2 workers are going to come, how much more housing is necessary? And George basically said, no, we don't. We saw the evidence, though, it's going up. But that's kind of, the agricultural workers are staying the same, so there's fewer agricultural workers to some extent at all. But the one thing we can't ignore is we need more housing. Uh, so we are going to be, I, mean, I know the state law just passed a bunch of bills to make building housing more, streamline it, make, make it easier for people to do it. There's a lot of bills, a lot of emphasis on building housing. And that's also another reason that when we've had, Carlos can vouch for this, when we've had conversations about what an H-2A project might look like in, let's say, the commercial zone somewhere or an industrial zone that's underutilized, we want it to look like a building that could be used for something other than housing of employee workers after that because we don't know. And if the need does drop off in a few years, and you know, we wouldn't want someone to invest a lot of money in a building that's worthless for any other purpose. So that's something we're, we're very aware of. Yeah, I had a question for, um, back there there was a question about non-H2A workers. Um, is there, is there any restrictions on how many non-H2A workers can um, live in a R1 or R2 home right now in the city? Uh, no, the, we, we regulate according to the state law, which is, as I said, uh, allows more people to live in a house than the H2A program. I mean, if, if, it, is, if it does violate state law, we could do something, but that's kind of hard to do. It's very permissive. Hi, I'm, oh. <laughs> I'm Mike Mose, I'm the city council in here in Santa Maria. I'd like to make a comment rather than ask a question. Further from your lips, further down, yeah. There you go. Okay, now? Yeah. Yeah, I know there's a lot of agreement among various issues. We all agree that farmers need workers we all agree that the H-2A program is a good thing, and we all agree that H-2A is, uh, should be targeted into R3. But I think the issue that brings us all here today is how H-2A should be targeted into R1. And I think we need to figure out a way where we can decide what R1 housing is suitable for H-2A and what R1 housing isn't. So let's take the case of 10 H2A workers living in a house. Well, the house next door to my house is not a suitable place for H2A workers. However, there are places in Santa Maria where the house next door has 16 people living in it. And under those circumstances, I doubt the homeowners in that community would mind having a house with 10 people. So I think what we need to do is to figure out which houses are suitable, which R1 zoning houses are suitable for H2A, and which aren't. And it may have to do with getting conditional use permits, or maybe even zoning in certain areas of the city, if that's legal. That's definitely something we're looking at and working on as part of this whole process. Any other questions? Wow. Amazing. Go. Further from your lips, Bob. Yeah. Further from my lips. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm on the Planning Commission, and we're struggling with this tremendously. And the reason this topic came up primarily was because uh, an H2A housing her house was rented out and uh, it impacted the neighbors around it and it was handled um, not terribly elegantly. 
personally by the, by the property owner. Um, but there's a much deeper problem here that I think the planning city council are going to have to work with the ag industry on. And that is that what we're talking about is about 1,500 to 2,000 people on the H-2A program, I think in, in any particular year, which is about 10% of the overall labor problem that we have with the ag industry and how and who they hire and, 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 and people who live in the thing. So even if we were to come up with the perfect solution for H-2A, we're dealing with 10% of the problem. You're, and, and, and evidently, it's the 10% that is, that is actually um, being regulated to a point where you are able to minimize, relatively minimize, the number of people that live in these homes. So the focus, I mean, we can focus on H2A because it makes us feel better about what happened back a few months ago. Or we can start talking about the much, much bigger picture of what we're going to do about the 90% that is unregulated and is, is, it is also impacting our, our R1 areas. Um, because if we don't regulate that, then we can put 16 people into an R1 home, and as irritating as that is, we evidently have nothing that can stop us, stop that from happening. And so we're going to end up with a more and more impacted set of residential areas. That's what we need to be discussing: is the overall impact to our R1s by putting a lot of people in them, not just H2A. Sure. I did go out to Guadalupe a couple of weeks ago and I talked to people self-help out there. And they know about this problem. They said they're looking into it. And I'm a big supporter of self-help because that is my home. We built our house 20 well, years ago by self-help. 28 years ago with self-help. But they're looking into the problem. Why can't we go and talk to them and see what they're thinking about and stuff? No, we certainly we plan to. All the things. So when we say a variety of options, we, we are pursuing all of the options. And I think the other thing, too, is that we talk about flexibility because you don't want or you hear people talk about kind of there's no one size fits all or there's no one solution. Uh, but that's because you're you're looking at that and meeting those needs in different ways. And so if you try to solve kind of one problem in the same way, you're going to create other problems. And so that's why it's important to have a mix in that to be able to offer that solution and, and take a little bit of this problem here and a little bit of that problem there. So it's that's why it's so important to have that variety, to have those options so that you can address it uh, on a multi from, from many different angles to try to be most successful in addressing those. So yes, we've had those conversations. Um, we're happy to continue to have those conversations. We are very solutions oriented. I would just like to add that that's the, when we started this process, the reason, one of the reasons why we wanted to have these forums was to educate uh, ourselves, our staff, to come up with some ideas. We, we are looking at this like there is some short-term solutions or potential solutions, some medium, distant, time, distant in time solutions, and then some longer-term solutions. We're obviously not going to be able to implement them all at once, but I want to assure you all we are looking at all, all options, the variety, um, and, and I think we've been fairly successful in getting a lot of information out there. The fact there wasn't as many questions tonight as there have been in the past, I think it's, it's proven we've gotten some of the important information out there. I don't see any more questions, so. I want to close with two things. Oh, one more question. I was just wondering if the uh, H-2A uh, program allows uh, houses near uh, schools and parks? Yes, absolutely. Just like any other residential zone. And as I said, these people have gone through uh, 
background checks and, and there haven't been any incidents. So that is not really a, something of concern to either the uh, federal government, the state government, or, or even the city. I'd like to add to that, to that. EDD, HDD is on housing inspections and regulated how many people can be in those homes, sir. Furthermore, background checks and our U.S. consulate are interviewing the hardworking folks that we're bringing over here. And I challenge you to find a house that we can actually give you a roster of who should be living in that house. So, so whether it's five, six, seven, eight, whatever it may be. So we could have that posted. And I, I don't think there's any other house in San Marino that could give you that type of information. So they're heavily screened, sir. And I, I, uh, I think by speaking with um, the police department here, uh, they've had fantastic results uh, on, on um, well, by not having any calls. Any kind of crime. Yeah, to add as a grower also um, working in human resources to our Carlos states, we also have um, emphasized also and understand the neighbors and we provide them with house rules. And we follow up, we do weekly inspections. I can speak for us as a grower that we do weekly inspections and we expect them to have a clean home. Why we emphasize with them that EDD and the state will come randomly. They won't let us know when they show up. And if at any time they find inhumane, um, that their housing is inhumane, if they have food left out, if their behavior is not acceptable, they understand that they will have their contract terminated. And believe me that they come from areas, rural areas in Mexico, where to them this is such a privilege and they're not willing to lose this privilege because of one of their roommates or even themselves um, do something that will risk that for them. Because they're not having to go through, um, you know, they're not having to go through the hills or, you know, hiring a coyote risking their lives. They have the opportunity to be able to walk around um, and just, you know, use the money that they earn to send back home because they don't have those privileges. Um, and they're not willing to risk it. I mean, we can speak, we have close to 600 H2As and we supervise the housing, we talk to them, we go to Mexico and also um, have videos with them and explain to them the benefit and the privilege that they have and they understand that. And when they get here, they value that. Um, and we explain to them even they can't walk, um, they can't just walk on the street without following. I mean, we go to the extent of showing them this is the walking sign. That's why the, there's yellow lines on the road. Because really they don't understand it. And to, to what they were saying earlier, we have to teach them. We, we have to teach them. And as a grower, we take that full responsibility and I speak for us. And if any other growers need help or assistance with that, you know, I'm here. We're here definitely as growers, as um, a community that we are in agriculture to help each other and, and understand that. And we also apologize, although we weren't that grower that I told me that did that, but we do list our names in the housings um, in case neighbors, and we tell them if a neighbor asks that they want to speak to the owner, you give them my number 24 7. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been working in the fields uh, for the last nine to ten years of my life, and the last fifteen years I've worked with a lot of H2A um, employees. And uh, as somebody that sees them and works alongside them, you know, day after day, I, you know, I hear stories of how they feel and their side too, and it's completely understandable. You know, my family. We own multiple properties. We rent it out to people that need homes that you know can't really afford them other places because the rent is extremely high you know, in these areas. But from what I've seen, a lot of them mainly their only thoughts are come to work and provide for the family. I've seen a lot of them ask me, "Oh, what can I do for fun? Or can I go? Is there a place to go bowling? Where can I play soccer?" And you know, like, "Oh, what's a cool movie to see?" Even though sometimes they don't even understand what's you know, they speak in the movie, they just want to, you know, experience something that they've never had before. And having family that comes from a similar uh, rural area, I can relate to them. I've had the benefit of being born a citizen and being, um, you know, in a world where I have all the opportunities. And I'm happy my father gave me the opportunity to work in the fields. I'm learning what it's like to have the sun beating down on my back 
And I remember the first week working there, I'd go home and fall asleep until the next day. And I know a lot of them can relate to that. I'll ask them, oh, what did you guys do yesterday? Well, we went home, we prepped our lunch, we watched the movie, and we fell asleep. And the way I see these regulations of their living, their food, um, basically what they are and are not allowed to do, I've seen them follow it for the most part to a team. And what I've realized in this is, yeah, every once in a while there's maybe a bad apple in the box, but the whole box isn't spoiled. And that's something that I see not just as you know a fellow worker, but somebody that loves the city. I was raised here, and my whole life's been here. And I see them you know, putting in an effort and they wouldn't be needed if more people decided to work in you know, the fields. But as I heard earlier, someone state that people aren't really raised to go and work in the fields. You know, they want business jobs. I have a lot of friends who rather be unemployed than work in the fields. So when I look at them, it's, it's, it reminds me of what it's you know, like to be an American and you know, work for what you want and work for what you got. So I understand that people have issues with, um, you know, like, houses are full of other people that, you know, have, have a lot of, like, up to 10, 12 people inside, but they don't do it because they want to. And sometimes it's the only option, and I think that's something that we got to be better at as a community. And I feel like it's another one of those American ideals. If we want it, we have to work for it, and we have to find something that isn't just beneficial for us, but for everybody, because we're all in it together. I, I want to thank you for coming. I, I want to apologize. I was so anxious to get the meeting started that I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> yeah. But most everyone here knows me. <laughs> I think I'm yeah. uh, My name is Phillips, and I'm assistant city attorney. And exactly how I got in charge of all this is, is not quite clear to me, but it's been, it's been an, an interesting journey. And I also want to uh, apologize for not introducing. Uh, this is a, technically a joint meeting of the City Council and the Planning Commission. Uh, we did that because of the technicality of the Brown Act. Uh, we didn't really run into any issues. So we, even if they're not all here, uh, just in case a quorum of the legislative body showed up, uh, which it has. And I want to introduce them to all of you. I mean, I know. Uh, we have Mayor Bettino and Councilmember Waterfield, Councilmember Michael Cordero, and Councilmember Dr. Michael Motes. Feel free to applause. And we have two planning commissioners, uh, Robert Dickerson and Maribel Hernandez. So we didn't have a quorum of the planning commission, but uh, so it's a good thing we, we, we did the notice. Now, thank you again. I think this has been very informative for me. I hope it's been informative for you and for our elected and appointed officials. Uh, when the, the time for a decision comes, uh, I hope they'll feel uh, more assured and confident and that they'll be making the right decision. We're at, we, unfortunately, as many of you know who come to this, we didn't have a meeting for a while. Our last one was late August, and that was because of scheduling conflicts. It was very important to make sure as many uh, important people could be here, and so we lost some time, which has kind of compressed the rest of our schedule. The, the next meeting is tentatively scheduled, more than tentatively at this point. It's very much likely going to happen two weeks from tonight, the same location, same time, 530, uh, and we're not going to have a forum like this. We're going to basically bring forward staffs, basically the, the recommendations that we will probably bring bringing to the Planning Commission first and the City Council after that. Uh, we are in the final phases of putting together, as I mentioned, a short-term, long-term, middle or medium-term, long-term objectives. And we are we want to hear from you. We want to give the public a chance to speak before the Planning Commission needs to do its thing and then the City Council. So uh, feel free to mark that on your calendars if you have your phone with you uh, or watch it on YouTube later. Uh, with no further ado, thank you all for staying. And please we have a applause for our panel tonight. <laughs> Good night.